Hi, let us continue with our discussions about the curtailment of reinforcement. So far, we have talked about curtailment of reinforcement is a process of terminating or reducing the reinforcing bar at certain locations of a beam or a slab in order to minimize or optimize the reinforcement used as well as simplify the construction process without compromising the integrity or the safety of the structural element. It was mentioned that the curtailment is done on basis of the bending moment diagram of a member. When the required moment resistance reduces along a beam span, the amount of reinforcement can be reduced accordingly. Now in this video, we're going to talk about how specifically we deal with the curtailment of the reinforcement. Taking this diagram as an example, we have a continuous beam with the reinforcement bar provided. You see that there are areas where the reinforcement bar is being discontinued representing the process of curtailment of the reinforcement. Now the question is, how do we know that way we should stop the reinforcement? The answer lies with the load response of the beam when subjected to external load. To be more precise, we are looking at the MED per Z envelope diagram instead of the bending moment diagram. What does it mean by the MED per Z? It is a conversion of the bending moment acting along the beam into equivalent tensile force along the beam. You may obtain the MED from the bending moment diagram of the beam, where else the Z it will be the section modulus of the beam section. By dividing the MED over the Z, that gives you the tensile force caused by the bending moment diagram within the sections having the specific section modulus. Now, assuming a beam has a consistent cross section throughout, that means the Z here it will be constant. This will lead to the M per Z diagram to follow the same patterns as per the bending moment diagram. And then, this M per Z envelope diagram means that when you analyze a member's based on a series of the load cases, combining those, you get the envelope bending moment diagram. You use the envelope bending moment diagram divided by the Z that produces the M per Z envelope diagram as represented by this line. Due to the hogging moment at the internal support, you will see higher tensile force near to the internal support. And due to the sagging moment at the midspan of the beam, you will see a maximum MED per Z at the midspan of the beam. Now you need to do the curtailment of the reinforcement based on the MED per Z envelope diagram. Previously we mentioned about the nature of the approximations in the structural analysis. We cannot do curtailment in a very precise mode. Some tolerance may be provided in order to cater for that. This leads to a horizontal shift equivalent to an alpha 1 from the original MED per Z envelope diagram, resulting a curve something like this. Same goes to the sagging moment region. There is a horizontal shift at a magnitude of alpha 1. And this alpha 1 is calculated based on the formula here, which is in the functions of z and also the data. Bear in mind that this z here is not the same z here. 
the Z in the MED per Z envelope diagram is the section modulus which is a geometrical property of a beam's cross-section however the Z here is obtained from the struct and tie model of the shear link in the beam section the model assumes that a beam consists of an analogical truss where there are regions of tensile and compression with the diagonal strut taking the compressions by the concrete and also the vertical shelling taking the tension and then the Z here is assumed to be the distance between the two reinforcements which is assumed to be equals to 0 0.9 effective depth therefore you will need to be careful with the Z that you use to determine the alpha 1 not to be confused with the Z that you use to get the MED per Z envelope diagram as for the data here it represents the angle of the diagonal compressive strut assuming the beam section is lightly loaded and reinforced the diagonal strut here is with an angle of 22 degree by substituting this you get an alpha 1 equals to 1.125 D therefore you may straight away assume this alpha 1 here is equals to 1.125 times the effective depth of the section once you obtain this shifted M E D per Z now you may determine how the reinforcement bar can be curtailed let us first deal with the sagging moment region assuming that you have three groups of reinforcement where you have full reinforcement at this region exceeding certain locations the amount of reinforcement bar reduced by one third and then reaching the other locations another one third of the reinforcement bar is being reduced that gives you the arrangements of the reinforcement 100% here 66.7% here and 33.3% here now how do you know where you should have the reinforcement bar curtail? you may refer to the shifted MED per Z envelope diagram maybe divide it into three equal parts the 100% amount of reinforcement bar is designed to resist the maximum moment or more specifically maximum tensile force throughout the entire beam span the H area here represents the resistance given by the reinforcement when you provide 100% reinforcement this is the resistance and the resistance is greater than the required tensile force so that the reinforcement can effectively control the cracking on the beam you may maintain the same amount of reinforcement bar throughout the entire beam span only that you know there are regions where certain reinforcement bar is not really necessary it will consume more reinforcement leading to wastage of the material also it may lead to the congestion of the reinforcement at the junctions between the beams and the column now you need to do the curtailment the fundamental principle behind it is you will need to measure along the entire beam span there is no area you have your resistance less than the required tensile force bare minimum your resistance should be at least equivalent to what is required taking into account the requirements for the anchorage length allowing bone stress to be fully developed within a bar over a specific length now if you disregard the contributions of the development stress 
throughout the anchorage length. Theoretically, the stress within the bar will increase over the length until it reaches to the full capacity of the steel bar. This approach here adopts a more conservative estimation, ignoring the contributions in terms of the stress throughout the entire anchorage length leading to the effective resistance given by the reinforcement along the regions minus the anchorage length. It is after the anchorage length you may stop your reinforcement. That's why you see the first group of reinforcement bar being curtailed here and also here. The same principles apply to the second reinforcement. The line here represents the reinforcement. The H area here represents the resistance. LBD here represents the anchorage line. The resistance given by the second group of the reinforcement, it will be at this region minus the anchorage length at both ends. That's why you see the reinforcement bar of the second group stop here. And theoretically, the second group of the reinforcement bar should stop somewhere here. Since it is already outside the beam sections, you will keep the reinforcement. And then you will do the same for the third group of the reinforcement bar. Theoretically, you may stop your reinforcement bar somewhere here, plus an anchorage length, which leads to you stopping the third group of the reinforcement bar here. However, you know this is not a good practice. You should extend the reinforcement into the support region. And then observe where does the bearing starts. Bear minimum plus the anchorage length leading to you the reinforcement bar to be stopped here. This leads to you a situation where the third group of the reinforcement providing the resistance up to the support here. And then for the other end of the third group of the reinforcement, your resistance should reach here plus an anchorage length, that means you should stop your reinforcement bar at least here. Since this fall outside of the beam sections, that means you will keep this reinforcement bar as well. This explains how do you read the reinforcement bar here. You have all three groups of reinforcement bar 100% here. And then this is where you stop your first group of reinforcement bar, taking into the considerations of the anchorage length. Since the second group and the third group should stop outside of the beam sections, you will keep those in the beam section. That means you have 100% reinforcement bar here and 66.7% at the support here. As for this side, the second group of reinforcement bar stop after the anchorage length that give you 66.6% here and 33.3% here. The same concept apply to the hogging moment region where you need to estimate a shift of alpha 1 Let's say now again you have three groups of reinforcement provided. The highest tensile force appear at the support, leading you 100% reinforcement bar here. And then you do curtailment here, extending the remaining two groups of the reinforcement. Later you stop your reinforcement bar here, leaving the last group of the reinforcement extended until it ends here. Now how do you know where you should curtail the reinforcement? Again, you will look into the anchorage length. 
the H regions represent the resistance given by the equivalent amount of reinforcement. You need to make sure at no regions the resistance provided is less than what is required. Assuming the anchorage length, you have no stress developed within the reinforcement. Divide the resistance into three parts for this case and then start providing your reinforcement. You need to provide your tensile resistance up to here plus an anchorage length. This is where you stop the reinforcement. <coughs> and then, based on the resistance provided by this group of the reinforcement bar, this is where you can start with the anchorage length for another group. Now you will have your resistance greater than what is required and your reinforcement being curtailed here. Then based on the resistance provided by the two group of the reinforcement, this is where you need to provide your resistance plus an anchorage length and this is where you stop the third group of the reinforcement. By doing so, you ensure at no regions the resistance provided by the reinforcement throughout a beam is always greater than what is required so that the beam sections will not fail at any places along the span. And bear in mind that the final curtailment outcome is often influenced by the other requirements related to the serviceability, durability, and detailing. Taking this as an example, theoretically, you may stop all the reinforcement bar here. However, you know that in the actual practice, you still need top reinforcement bar here. And bare minimum, two units of 12mm diameter high strength bar. So, although your curtailment outcome states that you can stop your reinforcement bar here, most likely you're going to extend this towards the end of the beam until to the support. You need that reinforcement in order to tie the shear links in the beam. And also, in terms of the anchorage, you need to be careful. The anchorage length of the reinforcement at the bottom of the beam may not be the same as the anchorage length at the top of the beam. This is due to the considerations in terms of the poor and good bone conditions. For regions with good bone conditions, the required anchorage length it will be shorter. As for the regions with poor bone conditions, the required anchorage length it will be longer. Now, you might be curious, how do you determine the anchorage length? In fact, in our module of Reinforced Concrete Design 1, Chapter 5, we have mentioned how do we deal with the anchorage length. And due to the good and poor bone conditions, the basic anchorage length differs, and as a result, the design anchorage length differs. Under typical conditions, which we are referring to straight bar with a diameter of less than 32 mm grade 30 concrete, top bar will require at least 52 times the bar diameter and bottom bar will require at least 36 times the bar diameter. Coming back to this diagram, this diagram showcases how do you determine the curtailment of the reinforcement bar when there are three groups of reinforcement. Under some circumstances, two groups of reinforcement bar may be involved. Then you will need to work out the diagram by yourself, determine the resistance provided by the reinforcement, divided the group of the reinforcement based on the amount of reinforcement giving you an example 
let's say now 100% reinforcement comprises 4 units of H20 reinforcement. After you've done the curtailment, you may reduce the reinforcement by half, which is 2 units of H20 rebar. Then you will need to determine the resistance provided by 2 units of H20 rebar. In another case, if it involves 3 units of reinforcement, that means 3 H20, you know that reaching to the support, there is a minimum of 2 units of reinforcement. That means after you do the curtailment, that leads to you 2 H20. In this case, you cannot simply separate the resistance by half. You will need to calculate the resistance provided by the provided amount of reinforcement and then sketch the resistance provided accordingly. Find their intersections with the shifted MED per Z envelope diagram and then determine your anchorage length. Only then you determine where you curtail the reinforcement. And because of this process is rather tedious, it is quite seldom for engineers to do curtailment one by one in a very precise manner. Instead, engineers choose to use the simplified rules by identifying the respective locations as well as the amount of the reinforcement. Make sure you provide the reinforcement greater than the percentage indicated. This will lead to slightly more conservative provisions of the reinforcement so that the stability and the resistance of the beam sections is not compromised. Now that you know the concept of doing the curtailment, in the following videos, we're going to talk about another model, similar concept, except that it considers the development of the tensile stress in accordance to the anchorage length. And this model is actually seen in Eurocode 2, figure 9.2. I believe a lot of you have difficulty understanding this diagram. If you are interested to know more about this, stay tuned and we are going to discuss about it in detail in our next video.